Good morning, and welcome to this fifth Sunday in Lent radio broadcast. Our service begins with a call to worship from Mary Snorick on the piano, Abide with me. We prepare our hearts and our minds for worship. And good morning once again. Thank you so much for joining us on this fifth Sunday of Lent radio broadcast of Emanuel Lutheran Church in Wadena, Minnesota. Today's radio broadcast is given in memory of Jean Peterson by her son, Mark Peterson. May God forever bless Jean Peterson's memory. And thank you, Mark, for supporting this important radio ministry today in memory of your mother. We have one more Lenten Wednesday in this season of Lent. Hard to believe that season has gone by in in such quick order, but uh, this Wednesday, March 24th, you can join us for soup. drive through soup is available right outside our main parking lot doors from 5 to 5.45 p.m. And uh, we're grateful for the Congregational Life Committee for serving that meal at this time. And then you can join us for Hold an Evening Prayer. That will be available here on KWAD at 6.30 p.m. You can also worship with us on Facebook on 6.30, uh, at 6.30 in, in the evening that Wednesday. And as we approach the end of Lent, it, Lent, it's almost time for Palm Sunday, and that means it's time for the Palm Sunday meal. Our youth are sponsoring a Palm Sunday meal. They're going to serve a lunch this year instead of a brunch. And uh, even though we'd originally said RSVB by March 18th, we've extended that by just a few days. So if you will sign up right away today um, or tomorrow, we can uh, get you on board for that meal. It's a fundraiser for our youth, so um, receiving that meal would be a great help. So uh, March 28th from 11 to 1, you can have that wonderful lunch, Swedish meatballs and and, and all the fixings. So RSVP by calling the church office either uh, today and leave a message or tomorrow, 631-2738. You can go to our website, wadinaemmanuel.org. Or if you stop by tomorrow at the church building, you can sign up as well. Again, a free will offering will generate revenue for our youth ministry program. We do have a plan uh, for worship for Palm Sunday, Holy Week, and Easter, and here it is. So every Sunday, of course, you can continue to join us on the radio right here on KWAD at 9.30 every morning. You can catch that radio broadcast on our YouTube channel as well. But on Palm Sunday, our plan is to offer, that's uh, again, March 28th, our plan is to offer an 8.30 service with the waving of palm branches and all of that good stuff. Uh, We have also room in our fellowship hall for any overflow, uh, so we could accommodate really as many as 120 people that day. So uh, you can join us in the sanctuary on Palm Sunday. Of course, you can uh, catch the live stream as well on Facebook. On Monday, Thursday, April 1st, we will have two gathering opportunities, 2 p.m. in the afternoon or 6.30 p.m. in the evening, a service in our sanctuary Uh, That will have an emphasis on Holy Communion. And so you can join us in person there. We will live stream our 630 service as well. 
And on Good Friday, we've decided only to make that available on our Facebook page. That will be a 6.30 p.m. service as well. Um, on Easter Sunday, April 4th, you can join us in our sanctuary at 8.30 or 10 a.m. We're going to offer two services that day, again, with overflow into our fellowship hall as needed. And again, you can join us for the 8.30 service or watch that posted recording later on our Facebook page. This morning on the radio, we will celebrate communion once again today. So if you are joining us on March 21st, 2021, on the radio or on YouTube, you are welcome to commune with us. So gather bread and wine or juice from your home and join us at the altar a little later in our service. If you are joining us on a day other than March 21st, uh, you can still celebrate communion with us, but we would like you to use one of our house church or household church resources, and you can find that on our website, wadinaemmanuel.org. Those are the announcements this morning. Let's dive into worship. Hymn number 759, My Faith Looks Up to Thee. ELW number 759. join together in the prayer of the day. O God, with steadfast love, you draw us to yourself, and in mercy you receive our prayers. Strengthen us to bring forth the fruits of the Spirit, that through life and death we may live in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our anthem this morning is sung by the Emmanuel Sanctuary Choir, along with the Central Minnesota Boys Choir. Together they sing, Jesus is Mine.
Hello, my friends. I'm glad you've joined me today. Jesus tells, or <clears throat> Jesus doesn't tell a story today. We have a story about Jesus today. And some people wanted to see Jesus. They wanted to know more about him. And it was getting close to the time um, of Jesus' death. And so Jesus talks about how um, we need to let go of old things so that something new can happen. Something new can grow from uh, that old stuff. Um, kind of like a seed. If you are planting seeds to get them ready for the garden, right? Uh, you plant the seed and the seed has to break open so that the new plant can grow. And when I talked to the grown-ups this morning, I talked about how Jesus doesn't want us to be normal. Jesus wants us to remember that we are loved and that we are cared for by God and that when we remember that we are beloved, we can remember other people are beloved too. And that can change the world. So I'm going to tell you a story about a young woman named Malala Yousafzai. That's tricky to say. Let me try it again. Malala Yousafzai. There we go. So Malala was born in northern Pakistan in 1997. And she was named after a female Afghan hero who led a battle against the British. They didn't know that their own Malala would grow up to be a warrior too. Malala and her family follow a religion called Islam and the teachings of the Quran. We share a belief in the same God. Isn't that cool? I think that's really neat. Um, so her dad, Malala's dad, is a teacher and started a school called Kushal School because he believed that everyone had the right to education no matter who they were. And Malala was one of the students. But things started to change and not in a good way. There was a group called the Taliban. They are a group of extremists who fought their way to power in Afghanistan, just over the border from where Malala and her family lived. And their rules said that girls could not go to school and women were only allowed to leave the house with their dad, their brother, or their husband. And uh, then there was a terrible earthquake and one of the Taliban leaders said that people had to stop dancing, stop playing games, stop watching TV and listening to music, and girls could not go to school. It was forbidden. But Malala kept going to school in secret. And her dad disagreed with the Taliban, and he used his power to speak out against them on the radio. It was very brave. And then Malala joined her father, speaking to journalists and helping make a documentary about her experience to show the world what it was like. It was very dangerous to speak out against the Taliban, but Malala and her family kept fighting against the Taliban's rules. They were not doing what was normal because they believed that they could reform their world. In 2011, Malala received the National Youth Peace Prize in Pakistan, and she was nominated for the International Children's Peace Prize. And this made the Taliban so angry that it became very, very dangerous for Malala. She rode home from school on the bus one day, and two Taliban members came on the bus and hurt her really badly. She 
survived and was flown to the United Kingdom for treatment. And her family came to help her recover. She got to leave the hospital in January of 2013, so almost a year after they had tried to hurt her so badly. The whole world was so angry with these Taliban members for hurting this schoolgirl so badly. She was a student, just like you, using her voice to fight against something that wasn't okay. It was too dangerous for Malala and her family to return home, and so they got jobs where they were in the United Kingdom. And she, Malala did so well, she earned her place at a very famous university. And now Malala continues to campaign for the rights of women and girls everywhere, meeting powerful leaders and speaking all around the world. She even won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2014. She's the youngest person to ever win that special prize about peace. And she donated all the prize money to start a new high school for girls in Pakistan. A warrior of words, Malala has shown how one girl really can change the world. Jesus asks us to change the world too, and I think it can be really hard to think of how we can do that, especially if we're kids and students. But Malala shows us that even when it's hard, and even when um, things get scary and challenging, we can have courage to remember that everyone can be treated the same and loved the same and cared for in the same way because we're all God's good creation. You can change the world by being yourself, for using your voice, and caring for others. And I think that's really great news. I hope you have a wonderful week. I'll see you next time. Our first reading on this fifth Sunday of Lent is from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 31 to 34. I am reading from the NRSV translation. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Our psalm today is Psalm 51, verses 1 through 12. If you have a hymnal at home, please find Psalm 51 in the front of your hymnals preceding the hymn section and read the indented sections with me. Psalm 51 Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. In your great compassion, blot out my offenses. Wash me through and through from my wickedness and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my offenses and my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned, and done what is evil in your sight. So you are justified when you speak, and right in your judgment. Indeed, I was born steeped in wickedness, a sinner from my mother's womb. Indeed, you delight in truth deep within me, and would have me know wisdom deep within. Remove my sins with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be purer than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness that the body you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my wickedness. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. 
Our second reading this morning is from Hebrews chapter 5, verses 5 through 10. Again, I'm reading from the NRSV translation. So also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Last week was the one-year anniversary of the official declaration that COVID-19 was a global pandemic. As we reflect on the year that we have lived through, and as hope springs forth with vaccination options, an updated timeline for receiving those vaccinations, as well as the promise of warmer weather and the opportunity for outdoor gatherings again, I've heard a lot of talk about a return to normal. But what is normal? Wikipedia tells us that normality is a behavior that can be normal for an individual when it is consistent with the most common behavior for that person. Normal is also used to describe individual behavior that conforms to the most common behavior in society. However, normal behavior is often only recognized in contrast to abnormality. We've lived through a lot of abnormality and chaos in the past year. Not only did we have to navigate an unprecedented pandemic, which disproportionately affected marginalized people, We also continued to hear story after story of violence against black people, including Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Ahmaud Aubrey, George Floyd, and many others whose names we don't know, whose stories didn't make the national news. Everything was changing and at the same time, so much stayed the same. The unrest was almost constant. And now, as the names Breonna Taylor and George Floyd are in our news cycles again with trials and settlements and anniversaries, as violence grows in recent months and days against Asians and Asian Americans, we are called to something different. We are called to reform. And Jesus shows us the way. In today's story from the Bible, it is the week of Jesus' crucifixion. He has just entered Jerusalem in a subversive parade, and tensions are high. John 12, 20 through 33 tells it this way. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it. And those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, 
I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and thought that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. So lore has grown about Jesus in this time. And when people outside of the community ask to see Jesus, Jesus proclaims the vision of his ministry. In order for the seed to bear fruit, it must die. Those who follow Jesus must go where he goes. Whoever tries to retain their life will ultimately lose it. And this answer makes everyone listening uncomfortable. The Messiah is supposed to live forever, not die. And Jesus is once again denying expectations and asking his followers to do the same. I wonder if this isn't how we experience Jesus sometimes, too. We want to see Jesus, but only on our own terms and within our own set of expectations. I wonder if when we ask to see Jesus, like the Greeks did, that we really want to see Jesus. Or are we feigning interest because that's what we're supposed to do? That's what a good Christian would do. Or we ask, but we don't really want the real experience of Jesus. Because seeing Jesus might cause a discomfort that we'd rather not experience. I suspect that it's that last thing. We may ask truly to see Jesus, but we are unprepared for what that experience will be like. Because following Jesus sounds wonderful, right up until Jesus tells us that those who love their lives will lose them, and those who hate their lives in this world will keep them forever. I like my life, Jesus, we might say. I've got a beautiful family. I have a lovely home. I have friends. I have uh, a job that I love, right? I love my life. I don't want to lose any of that much less die. Yet again and again, we are reformed by God's love and God's presence through Christ. We are called to that work of reformation, the journey of letting the old fall away for something new to emerge. Change, even when it is welcomed, means death of something else. For Jesus, everything that he does is a reflection of who he is. And the truest reflection of Jesus, the truest identity of Jesus, will be seen in the hour of his crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. Jesus moves through death so that there will not be any place that we go that Jesus has not already been. But then Jesus rises to new life so that we might follow there also. When we were baptized in Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. This is the good news of the gospel. This is the good news of our lives of faith. This is what our baptismal journey is about. 
The resurrection doesn't just happen on that beautiful first Easter morning. It happens anytime there is new life. And new life happens anytime we cast off the weight of the status quo. When we refuse to follow social and cultural norms and expectations and embrace the abnormal life that Jesus invites us into, where all are beloved and all flourish. This is the work of reform, of reformation, and the kingdom of God. And so when Jesus asks us to hate our life, Jesus isn't asking us to hate our family, to hate our friends, to hate our jobs, to hate our community. Jesus is asking us to hate the status quo, to hate the cultural norms that cause us to be in conflict with one another, to cause us to see one person as human and the other as less than human. Jesus calls us to hate those parts of life that separate us from God. Author Oshetta Moore explains this much better than I can in her new book, Dear White Peacemakers. She writes, We were made to reflect the generous, self-giving love of God. When God breathed into the first human, igniting his soul with divine love, God never expected us to prove our worth or fight for significance. We were already worthy. We were already significant. Out of striving to prove ourselves to God, sin entered into the world. And not only introduced an anxiety of what God believes about our inherent identities, but also fueled the flames of competition between image bearers. Our current iteration of that is that of racism and the lie of white supremacy. She goes on to give us the first step in reform, claiming our belovedness. Because, she says, without belovedness, all you have to build your identity on are the lies of white supremacy. When you are held up in a system as superior and right simply because of the color of your skin, then you must live up to a certain standard of excellence, or you expect a certain level of comfort. Owning your belovedness because it's evidence of a reality where God's unconditional grace and love are standard and not some arbitrary social construct, is an essential act of resistance to the dehumanization of white supremacy. We often stop at our understanding of belovedness as that internal adjustment to live a more peaceful and gentle life. But belovedness is a powerful weapon used by the Spirit. What the world needs are more white peacemakers who know they are beloved by a loving God, and from that overflow seek the belovedness of others. Can you hear how this challenges the normal life, the normal culture? How it upends the status quo? Can you hear the echoes of the greatest commandment here? to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself? Oshada continues, Dear white peacemaker, Jesus says that in this world we will have trouble. But too, take heart, for he has overcome the world. He did this by first owning his belovedness and then proclaiming it to every single person he met. His belovedness empowered him to challenge social hierarchies based on fear of the other, offer relief to those who have been oppressed, and eventually to sacrificially love on the cross. When you are grounded in something other than your works or results, when you are grounded in a truer, deeper, soul-healing confidence, you can continue to press, even if it means death, to all your comforts and control. This is the kind of death that Jesus is calling us to. 
This is the kind of death that bears fruit. This is the kind of losing our life that not only helps us gain a different kind of life, but helps provide a new kind of life for all of God's good creation. We own our belovedness so we can proclaim the belovedness of others. Again and again, we are being reformed. The process is uncomfortable, but the status quo is untenable. When change happens within us, what could possibly take root and flourish? This week, I'd like you to really reflect on the status quo. I'd like to challenge you to find five minutes of time and make a list of everything that creates or maintains the status quo. It can be the status quo of our church, our local community, our society, our nation, etc. Name anything that comes to mind. You can start with my example from today. White supremacy upholds a status quo. Then, on a separate sheet of paper, make a list of things that disrupt or dismantle the status quo. Again, name anything that comes to mind. So, if you put my example of white supremacy on the list, then what disrupts it? Owning our belovedness and letting that overflow into seeing the belovedness of others. They don't have to be as fancy as that. They could be something even simpler. Anything that comes to mind that can dismantle the status quo, that is abnormal, that messes up the usual systems of how we do things. Then take inventory of those two lists. Where do you see the Spirit at work? Where do you see reformation in, a in action? Where can you join in that work of the Spirit? I leave you today with a blessing poem for peacemakers by Meta Herrick Carlson. This blessing has come near to your work and has already noticed a rumble beneath our feet. This feels different from preservation, for making begins beyond the instinct to protect and the hesitation around loss. Your making will not settle for what has already been and pushes on possibility without waiting for permission. It is powerful and free, which threatens the veneer of circumstances long unchallenged. They will tell you to quiet down or stop altogether. Persist, you maker of peace, in defiance of every invitation to use your power for something else. Showing up matters, and like the earth's tremble, can leave cracks in the facades that need to fall away in favor of peace stirred up for all. Amen. And we are so grateful, dear friends in Christ, for your continued generosity to our mission and ministry, the way that you are supporting us in prayer, the way that you are supporting us financially. We are humbled and grateful. Gifts can continue to be sent to P.O. Box 69 here in Wadena. You can drop gifts off at the church during the week, and you can visit wadinaemmanuel.org to explore ways to give electronically. Our service continues this morning with hymn number 323 in your ELW hymnals, God Loved the World, ELW number 323.
We cry to you for help, O God, praying for the church, the world, and all those who are in need. You write a new covenant on our hearts in baptism. Continue to wash us in your promises and reform our hearts to love you more deeply and serve our neighbors more faithfully. Lord, in your mercy, you make creation bear fruit. And we pray today for farmers and ranchers, for animals coming out of hibernation, for deserts and tundra where living conditions are harsh. Lord, in your mercy, you draw all people to yourself. We pray for nations preparing for elections, for countries suffering from fires, floods, storms, or famines, for those living in refugee camps. Lord, in your mercy. You know the troubles of our souls. We pray for those waiting for answers to prayers, for those whose lives are full of tears, for those sick in body or spirit, those in need of strength for their daily callings. Be with Sherry Anderson, Charles Carlson, Gary Johnson, Peggy Louine, Rick and Gail Johnson, Craig Reese, Dorothy Teal, Gary Burnt, Joan Clark, Doreen Johnson, Robert and Sue Ellen Kiffey, Kia Neuerberg, Pete and Karen Paulson, Matt Schiller, Jean Tollegson, Dick Wood, Eugene Wood, Dolores Yorick. We pray for those serving in our military along with their families at home, Max Labar, James and John Close. Victor Barbado, Joel Bertelson, Sean Evans, Joe Holweger, Karsten Jennings, and Eric Naley. Lord, in your mercy, you renew a right spirit within us. We pray for this assembly, for our pastors, our members and visitors, for all who worship with us in person, online, and on the radio. Open our eyes to see Jesus in one another and in the stranger. Lord, in your mercy, you are the source of eternal salvation. 
We remember before you the faithful witnesses who have gone before us, especially those who have died recently, Irma Quincer, Joanne Olson, and Dennis Teedy, who now rest forever in your peace. Bring comfort to their families and inspire our faith through their witness. Lord, in your mercy. Now is the acceptable time to offer our prayers to you, God of grace and truth. Receive them in your mercy and grant us all that we need. In Jesus' name, amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please take a moment to share the peace with those in the room with you, as well as reaching out using your favorite electronic media method to share a word of peace with others. Today, as we gather, we are gathered across time and space. We're gathered also in hope, and some may be feeling despair. However it is that we gather, there is room for us at this table we call communion. If you're gathering with us on the radio this morning, on Sunday, March 21st, 2021, this fifth Sunday of Lent, You are part of this community of believers, and we invite you to join us at the table this morning. Gather some bread from your home and some wine and juice if you have it, and believe in faith that that bread you are holding, that wine, that juice you are holding, becomes the body and blood of Christ. In this meal, we receive Christ himself and are fed with love and forgiveness, and we become love and forgiveness that will transform the world. God will make it so. Friends, in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He blessed it and broke it, and he gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave them He gave it for them all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. 
Let us pray together as our Savior has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Please let us share this meal with one another. Share it with those in the room with you, speaking these words, the body of Christ given for you, and the blood of Christ shed for you. If you have only bread at home, be assured that even in this one element, Jesus is fully present, loving, and forgiving you. And if you're the only one in the room, hear these words, the body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. However you are receiving this meal today, may you be blessed by God's mercy, love, and forgiveness. Let us come to Christ, who is broken and poured out for you. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Let us pray. Merciful God, accompany our journey through these 40 days. Renew us in the gift of baptism that we may provide for those who are poor, pray for those in need, fast from self-indulgence, and above all that we may find our treasure in the life of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Receive this blessing. The blessing of Almighty God, the wisdom and power of Christ Jesus, and the light of the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 618 in your ELW hymnals, Guide Me Ever, Great Redeemer, ELW number 618. Praises, songs and praises, I will raise.
is forevermore, evermore. I will raise forevermore. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. In addition to our Sunday morning radio broadcast, we also offer a live stream on Facebook, house church gatherings, and household church, worship and communion in person with those who live in your home or a small group of households. We also have a growing Facebook campus where you can find fellowship, event info, daily devotions, and prayer. You can access sermons and other resources anytime on our YouTube channel. For more information on any of these opportunities, visit our website at wadinaemmanuel.org.